unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. to the worship service for New Life Community Church in Hobart, Indiana. My name is Dan Goody. It's my privilege to serve as a location pastor here uh, for the New Life Hobart congregation. And uh, this morning, it's Memorial Day weekend. We want to extend a special welcome to those of you that are part of our church family, uh, to those of you that are close by and um, are, are part of our, our friendship network. Uh, maybe uh, you joined from some far-flung corner of our country and uh, just checking in today because you've got a family or friends that attend New Life Hobart, and, and we're thrilled to have you along uh, with us. We'd appreciate it if you'd check in with us. If you're watching on Facebook, you can do that on chat, uh, on the chat feature there. Just let us know that you're watching. Uh, you can do it as well through uh, YouTube. If you go to our website and are watching that way, there's a, a tab there that you can check that just says welcome. Click onto that. It gives you a virtual connection card and an opportunity not only to let us know that you're part of the service today, but if you kind of click through the boxes, there's a place to share prayer requests or give us information to ask questions, and uh, we're happy to respond to you. Always eager to hear from you, and if we can be of help to you, uh, then you can contact us at Hobart at newlifechicago.org and we'll be happy to get back to you. Well, it's Memorial Day weekend. Uh, tomorrow we remember specifically those who have served our country and given their lives, many of them, uh, for the freedom that we enjoy. Uh, most households have some connection to someone who has served. I know for Diane and I, uh, on this day, we remember uh, my folks, both who served in the military. My mom was an army nurse, my dad in the Navy, both toward the end of uh, World War II. And uh, then Diane's dad, whose picture is actually here in uniform, uh, he served in the, in the U.S. Army as well. Uh, they are all home with the Lord now, but we remember them and honor them for the sacrifice, the investment they made in our nation by serving in the military. And uh, we particularly remember those who have given their lives uh, that we might enjoy freedom. And so we honor them. We say thank you to them on this Memorial Day weekend. And, and we want to do that at the beginning of our service with this particular tribute. Extraordinary men and women went before us with unmatched resilience, enduring hardship, when called upon to defend and liberate, they said yes. They found courage to rise with every son, loyalty toward their country, discipline for every command. Even in the darkest hours, they said yes. They cherished and fought for freedom, so those coming behind them were assured of it. And when the moment came for them to give it all, their futures never to be written, they said, yes. Today, we think upon their sacrifice and find our way to honor them, saying yes to making the most of what they gave us and filling the earth with God's goodness. 
We thank them for their yes. They will never be forgotten. We do say thank you. We do remember for those that, uh, that said yes with their lives. If you're currently serving or if you have served in the military, then, then we say, yeah, uh, say thank you to you as well. We're grateful for um, the sacrifices that you've made, for the investment that you made, and for the liberty that is ours because of that investment. And we're grateful. Let's begin our service this morning with this word of prayer. Father, we're grateful to you for our nation. We pray for its leadership. We pray, Father, for uh, the crises that we are in in this time and pray that you would bring, it, uh, bring us through it with vibrance and with uh, increased commitment to you, a better understanding of, of your love for us and care for us. Uh, Father, we're grateful for those who over the years have given their lives that we might continue to experience freedom. And we want our lives to be lived well in the freedom that is ours in this great land. And Father, we, we thank you most of all, however, for the freedom that is ours in Christ Jesus because of the, the sacrifice that you made and that he made on our behalf. And so we remember and rejoice in that as well today. We lift up our hearts before you today. We worship you. We honor you. And we give you praise. Be honored in what we do together today. In Jesus' name, amen. i uh -huh. 
one more time if you believe this. There's nothing I'm better than you. There's nothing I'm better than you. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. It was about six years ago that uh, the movie The Monuments Men was released. It's a uh, war movie set in World War II about a, a, a platoon that was put together largely of uh, artists, uh, museum curators, uh, professors, other experts in the art field who were tasked with uh, finding and retrieving and returning uh, to rightful owners masterpieces, artwork that had been stolen by the Nazis, all this taking place near the end of World War II. One of those pieces that was featured in the movie was called the Bruges Madonna, um, a sculpture by Michelangelo out of marble that uh, pictured uh, the Virgin Mary and the Christ Child uh, it was taken from a cathedral in Bruges, Belgium, and it was found and successfully uh, returned to Our Lady, uh, the Church of Our Lady in uh, Bruges, Belgium, from which it had been taken. Uh, masterpieces uh, like that are irreplaceable. Uh, whether they're sculptures or paintings or some other form of art, uh, they're admired for their uniqueness, for their beauty, for their contribution to culture and uh, the world of art, and, and sometimes for the story that they tell. But never do admirers stand before a sculpture and say, good job, sculpture. Never do they stand before a framed painting and go, way to go, painting. Uh, no, they, they're not. While they admire the artwork, they, they commend the artist. Um, these masterpieces don't have anything to do with their creation, with their contribution. Each one of them was made by an artist, a creator, a workman who crafted them. And so it is with us. Last week we began our series, Made for More, through the book of Ephesians, as we talked about uh, needing a, a change in paradigm, if you will, uh, that, that which takes place in our hearts and minds that would give us a, a different view, a different a definition, a different description of the church. Uh, not as something that we go to or a collection of programs that we either put on or participate in. Not an activity, but an identity. Uh, and that's what Jesus called us to, isn't it? He said, I will build my church. And he's called us into relationship with himself. And, and we then become his body, his bride. Uh, we're his church. The church is us. And so we, the church, the body of Christ, are the, are the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. That's where we ended our study last week at the end of chapter one. And the world needs more Jesus. Uh, not that we uh, are to invite the world in totality to church, though we'd love to have them come. But the reality is that, I, that that's not God's way of winning the world. His way of winning the world is much more about him sending the church to the world. We're the ones that are deployed into every nook and cranny of society where we live and work and learn and play, where we shop, where we have influence. It's that saturating pervasiveness that we talked about last week. Well, Ephesians 2 uh, begins by telling us uh, who we are, and then how it is that we're to behave. And, and right in the middle of the chapter, verse 10 of the 22 verses that make up the chapter, we read, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Before we talk 
much about what that means. Let me, let me sort of give you a flyover like we've talked about doing uh, for each chapter and put it into context because, because a text without a context, as a professor of mine used to say, is simply a pretext. In other words, it can be a point that make a point that really is not the point. And, and so when we do that, we can make the Bible say just about anything we want it to say. And a lot of people do. And so we're always wise to be like the Bereans that we find in Acts chapter 17, about whom is, is said, they examined the scriptures daily to see if what Paul said was true. Well, Paul continues in his letter by reminding the Ephesians of their pre-conversion condition. This is what it says as he begins the chapter in verse 1. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sin. The you applies to you and me as much as it does to the Ephesians to whom Paul was writing 2,000 years ago. And we, like they, are, are not just diseased. We're not just uh, dysfunctional. We're not just desperate. It says we're dead. We don't need to turn over a new leaf. We don't need to go see a counselor. We don't, we don't need a medical doctor. What we need is a miracle. He goes on to write, we're dead in our transgressions and sin in which we used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air and the spirit that is now at work in those who are disobedient. A, a bit of an aside here, but, but we talk a lot about being Christ followers. It's it's at least in part a definition of what it is to be a disciple, right? Uh, the one who learns from and follows after Jesus. Well, the truth is everyone is following someone. And the ultimate distinction is in your destination. And there's only two options. One is heaven and the other is hell. Because the two ways are headed in opposite directions. And, and we're born headed one way, and, and we need to experience a miracle if we're going to turn around. That's what verse 4 introduces for us with the word but. It's, a, it's always a word of strong contrast, and it introduces a change in both our direction and our destiny. It says we will experience all that is new when we trust Christ alone for our salvation. That's the big idea of the chapter that there's this newness for us. He writes, because of his great love, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions, for it is by grace you have been saved. You see, it begins with this new birth. In verse 6, it says that that new birth then gives us new life. Uh, that new life is what God describes as having raised us with Christ from the dead. It's a resurrection life, and it's a reigning life. We're seated with him in the heavenlies, as we saw even in chapter 1 last week. And then it brings a new role. We are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. This is what I want to come back to in a few minutes, the focus of our paradigm shift today that we need to embrace. The rest of the chapter also speaks about a new person in verses 15 and 16, and a new family in verse 19, and a new dwelling or a new home at the end of the chapter, verse 22. The central question then is, is what is our new role in this new home as part of this new family and as a new person? Well, it's, it's being the church. It's not, it's not joining something to help out. It's, it's about being that which is going to make a difference in the world in which we live. You see, being part of the church is usually seen as joining something, uh, becoming a member, Though the reality, biblically, is that that takes place the moment you're born into God's family. Because you, you remember, we are the church. It's also commonly understood as, 
as volunteering in one or more of the ministries of the church. And that's important. <laughs> Don't misunderstand me. Um, but I do not believe that being God's workmanship is about us primarily being a volunteer or helping out. Probably all of us have uh, shopped at Home Depot at one point or another. And uh, they have an interesting slogan. It is, you can do it, we can help. I think there is a mindset shift, a paradigm shift that would help the church if we were to embrace that kind of perspective. Most churches operate with a, we can do it, you can help kind of mindset or approach to ministry. And so we invite you, in fact, we beg you, we plead with you to volunteer, to help us in what we're doing. Again, don't get me wrong, we need your help. But, but that's not primarily what God has made you for. As his workmanship, as his artistic masterpiece, he has made you for a one-of-a-kind mission and, and put you in a place where only you can accomplish that. It's how he intends you to fill everything in every way with his body, the church, the local church, New Life Holbert, for example, or, or any other local church that names the name of Jesus and proclaims his word as true. Uh, churches like that can't fill your neighborhood. They can't fill your workplace. They can't fill your school or, or where you shop or where you recreate unless you fill those places <laughs> because actually you're the church. And so that's how the church uh, gets to fulfill what God has designed for us to be created in Christ Jesus. To do good works. I want you to hear me well because, because God has made you for more. In chapter 10, verse 8 of Job, Job says to God, your hands shaped me and made me. God said through the prophet Isaiah in chapter 43, verse 21, the people that I have shaped for myself will broadcast my praise. You see, we we have an artist who has made us as a masterpiece. And we also have an assignment that, that artist has given to us. How God has shaped us uh, is determined by um, his purpose for each of us. Big picture, collectively, that's to glorify him. Because everything that we do as God's children, as his church, is to bring glory to God. But there is also a, a specific assignment that God has given to each of us. The word translated workmanship comes from the word from which we get our word poem. Uh, God is saying about each of us that we're a handcrafted work of art, like a poem written by a poet, like a scene painted by an artist, like a, like a sculpture chiseled by a craftsman. You're not, a, you're not an assembly line product. <laughs> your DNA is unique to you, and so is your duty. Uh, you're, you're one in, in 7.8 billion. You're unique. In Psalm 139, God tells us that he is has knit and woven us together in sort of a tapestry. And before we were ever born, God had completely written out our diary. We find that in verses 13 through 16, if you want to check that out. God told Jeremiah, before you were born, I set you apart for my special work. <laughs> it's sort of the Old Testament uh, complementary passage, sort of Old Testament parallel to what we're looking at today in Ephesians chapter uh, 2, verse 10. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We're God's workmanship. 
We're the ones whom he has made. We're, we're masterpieces made for more. Created in Christ Jesus. We're, we're made by an artist, by a master. We're to do good works. We're made for an assignment. He's given us a mission. Uh, and God has prepared all of this in advance. We're, we're made mindfully. In advance, there's, there's the, that which he has done beforehand. It's that which we're to do. We've been made in accordance. The words to do uh, mean to, to behave or to live or to walk. We find the same word in 1 John chapter 2, verse 6, where we read, whoever claims to live in him, that is Jesus, must walk as Jesus did. In Romans chapter 8, verse 20, 29, it tells us, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son. In other words, there's a model after which we're to be fashioned. Uh, we're to, to both look and act like Jesus. And in a sense, uh, we become his self-portrait. We become his self-portrait. The master artist is, is making us a, a masterpiece with a mission. <laughs> and, and part of the paradigm shift that we need to understand is that the church's responsibility is to help you fulfill the mission that God has sent you on in where it is that you live and you work and you learn and you play in your spheres of influence, as I like to call it. And, and that's how it is that, that you end up taking Jesus, more of Jesus, into every nook and cranny of your world. As you do that, where you live and work and learn and play, and another Christian, uh, another Christ follower takes Christ in all of his glory into where he lives, she lives, and works, and learns, and plays. Pretty soon you have this, this mosaic of Christ followers that are filling everything in every way, everywhere. Rather than the church saying to you, we can do it and you can help. So come and volunteer. <laughs> we collectively as the church need to be saying to you, you can do it and we can help. We want to assist you in being successful and, and living out the great commission as a disciple and as a disciple maker where it is that you live and you work, and you learn, and you play in that sphere of influence into which God has placed you. Because you may be, at this point, the only Christ follower there. And Jesus isn't going to get there in any other way than through his church, which is you. The change in our way of thinking, our paradigm, is, is from more volunteers to more masterpieces, from thinking about the church saying, we can do it, to you can help, to, to our understanding that the church is really saying, you can do it, and we can help. It will require a willingness on your part for God to make you into a masterpiece that he can use wherever he has sovereignly placed you. And perhaps you'd be, you'd be willing to express that desire, that willingness on your part in a prayer that might sound something like this, Dear Heavenly Father, do whatever it is that you need to do in me to make me in the image of your Son. Make me your masterpiece. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I wonder if a prayer like that would express the desire of your heart. While you think about that for a minute and you're, about your willingness to pray something like that, uh, I want first 
for you to watch this from Tommy and Eddie. Ephesians 2.10 says that we are God's workmanship, his masterpiece. I don't know about you, but when I get up in the morning and look in the mirror, I don't really see a, a masterpiece, you know? I mean, maybe a Picasso, it's like, <laughs> but I wanna be his masterpiece. I wanna be everything he created me to be. And so I go to him in prayer and I say, dear heavenly father, do whatever it takes to mold me into the image of your son. Make me your masterpiece. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Hi. Whoa. Who are you? I'm God, you said the prayer, so here I am. You're not God. No, I am. You said the prayer, that's how it works. Okay, okay, if you're God, then uh, make it snow in here. You know what, I really don't wanna make it snow in here because it'd get kinda yucky. Yeah, you're not God. Why do you say that? God wouldn't say yucky. I do, it's a Greek word. Oh. Okay, okay, um, if you're God, what does Lamentations 15.9 say? Lamentations is only five chapters. It's a very short book. Oh, why was it so short? I was tired of lamenting. Oh, okay, okay. If you're God, who's gonna win the World Series this year? I'm really not into playing games. Why are you so much into playing games? You are God. Well, gave it away. You answered my question with a question. I did? <sighs> yeah, I do that, don't I? I did it again. <laughs> Step right up, here we go. Okay. All right. Hey, what are we doing? I'm gonna make you my original masterpiece. This is the process. Oh, okay, got it. Yep. Wait, wait, what are these about? These are the tools I'm gonna use to make you into my original masterpiece. Okay. Yep. Hang on. Yeah. I thought you were a carpenter. That's my son. Step right up, here we go. Okay. Oh, hey God. Mm -hmm. How do you know what to chisel away and what to leave? I take out everything in your life that doesn't belong there, kinda like dead weight. Ooh, speaking of dead weight, could you chisel right here? It showed up when I was in my 20s and grew around and became back fat. I don't even know why you created that, but I can't get rid of it. I mean, I've tried everything. Like, I tried running, I tried lifting weights. My wife actually talked me into trying Pilates. That was awkward, but I can't get rid of it. So if you would just chisel around here, and then, you know what, if you chisel a line right here and maybe four to five, maybe eight lines right here, that would be awesome. <laughs> You're funny. You made me that way. I also made the platypus. With the platypus? All I'm saying is most of my children, when it comes to this process, they just want to talk, but they don't want to do the work. So do you want to talk or can I chisel? Talk, chisel, No, talk, no, chisel. no, 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 no. I choose to chisel. All right. Through my Holy Spirit, I'm going to bring up things in your life that I want you to work on. Like your anger. Mm. I created the emotion, but you use it in the wrong way. Um, compare yourself to others instead of me. You tell little white lies because you want to people please. You're lazy. But you try to fool everybody by looking really, really busy. You have a problem with lust? Well, time out. <laughs> I don't really have a problem with lust. You don't have a problem with lust. No, I can do it anytime I want. Hang on a second. I mean, I, I gotta admit, I, I feel like you've been doing some great work and I'm looking pretty good right now. All right, when you look in the mirror, who do you see? I see me. Okay, then I need to keep chiseling away because ultimately you and other people need to see my son. Okay, don't misunderstand me. It's just um, when I look more like Jesus, people get uncomfortable around me. I mean, even my church friends and they're like, oh, you're holier than thou, you know? And, and I, don't, I don't think I'm supposed to make people uncomfortable. So what you're saying is you'd rather play God in certain areas of your life than for me to be God over your whole life. That is not what I said. It's what you meant. Yes, it is. Um, it's hard to talk to you. You know everything that I'm thinking. I'm just saying you've done some great work. Maybe we take a break, a sabbatical from each other, you know. I'll stay right here and then, you That's know. That's just it, you never just stay right there. You're either moving toward me or away from me, but never you just stay. What you're doing is called control. Do you want to control things in your life or can I chisel? Control, chisel, control, no, chisel. No, chisel, chisel. All right. But can we chisel where I want? That's called control. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Now this right here, this secret sin that you keep running to whenever you're hurting, angry, lonely, tired, that you think you're fooling everybody, but it's making you a whitewashed tomb. Are you ready for me to chisel this out of your life? Yeah. You see, it's a process. It's not a sprint, it's a marathon. It's your whole life. And you care so deeply about what other people think of you. It's rubbish, it's garbage. The greatest thing you're ever gonna hear is at the end of your life when you hear me say, well done, good and faithful servant, 
That's what you keep your eye on. That's the prize, heavenward. <coughs> oh, that hurts. Oh, trust me, this hurts me more than it hurts you. Right. <coughs> okay, I'm sorry. I just, I don't think you understand this pain. Pardon me? You're asking me to sacrifice a lot, God. Don't talk to me about sacrifice. I know all about sacrifice. I sent my son to die on the cross for pain, for sin, but I also did it for another reason, to give you freedom. Do you know what insanity is? Insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting different results. And there are things that you've been doing for years, these empty wells that don't have anything to offer. You've been going to them and it's insane. Allow me to chisel them out of your life. Um, allow me to produce character where you keep focusing so much on your image. Okay, but I was thinking. Your thoughts are not my thoughts. Okay, but if we went another way. Your ways are not oh, my ways. Oh, I can't. You can't what? I, I, I can't be good. That's your excuse. That's your excuse is that you can't be good. It's not an excuse, I can't. Oh, my child, in the beginning, I said it was good. I made you good. Be good. Yeah, but you and I both. What? Nothing. No, what is it? Nothing, okay? You wouldn't understand. I, God of all the universe, wouldn't understand something one of my children has to say. Try me. It's just, um. I let you down so many times, God. No, my child. You were never holding me up. I hold you up with my victorious, righteous right hand. Never the other way around. In this relationship, I hold you up. Okay. Chisel away. But just, just be prepared for what you're gonna find in there. Because I know who's inside there. Because I get up every morning and I look at him in the mirror, and I hate who I see. Because deep inside there, this, this, this little kid who gets up every morning and dresses like an adult. And I go out and I, and I, I try to do what I'm supposed to do, but I can't, okay? I can't be who everybody else expects me to be. God, I can't even be who I wanna be, much less who you created me to be. And so inside is this scared, stupid little kid but you chisel away, just be prepared. You have listened to so many voices for far too long that were not from me. And you have totally bought into the lie, haven't you? You think you're junk, don't you? When you lay your head down at night after you've done the dance to get the hug, you think you're junk. Listen to me. I don't take time to make junk. How can I show you that my love for you stretches as far as the east to the west? That How can I show you that my love for you has no end? I know, reach in your back pocket. What? Reach in your back pocket. Why? Are you arguing with me? Reach in your back pocket. Oh, God. Yes? I just meant, God, I'll do that right now. You're just saying my name in vain. Come on, it's, it's a name, it's a saying. It's a name above all names. It's more than a saying, it's more than a name. I want to teach you something about my name. Reach in your back pocket. Oh my gosh. You know what that is? Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a note. I, I wrote it when I was in college. How did you get this? Hello? Oh yeah. Go ahead, read it. I love Angie. Other side. Sorry. Dear God, did I hear you right today? Did I hear you say that you love me? Even though you and I both know I've messed up so many times. Did I hear you say you want to use me? And I feel so useless. If you'll take me and use me, then God, I give you all that I am. Take me. I love you, God. I love you too. 
and I love you too much just to leave you where you're at. This salvation that you hold, I don't want it to be some sentimental gush or some head knowledge. I want you to work it out in every detail of your life. And when problems come and chaos happens, don't look at it as a, as a prison, but look at it as a father disciplines his child, a father disciplines the ones he loves. I know, but it's gonna be tough. Yes, but you bought into the lie thinking everything was gonna be easy when you gave everything over to me. There will be trouble in this world, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. I want you to do something. I want you to look out there and I want you to say, Tommy is God's original masterpiece. Tommy is God's. No, not the way you see yourself or you try so desperately for others to see you, but maybe for the first time in your life, the way I see you, the way I created you. Tommy is God's original masterpiece. Yes, you are. And so are you. God doesn't make junk. You are an original masterpiece. I want you to sit with that for a minute. You are God's original masterpiece. You were made by the artist. You're made for an assignment. You are made in advance, not based on any merit of your own, not based on anything that you have done, earned or deserved, not based on any promise that you've made before you were ever born. And you are made in accordance to a model the image of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who died for you. The one who lives in you, if you have opened the door of your life to him. The one who lives through you, who will do his work through you as you remain surrendered to him. This morning, communion will serve as a, as a time to again say yes in our surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ, to embrace anew the freedom that is of forgiveness that is ours because of the price that Jesus paid for us. A time to surrender our lives once again to his work in us as he continues to make us his masterpiece. Communion is a time to remember. It's, it's a time to rejoice, to, re, to, to think about what it is that is ours because of what Jesus sacrificed for you and me. It's a time to recommit ourselves to living entirely for him because he deserves that from us. We can't repay him, but he gave his life for us. He died in our place. And he calls us then to be living sacrifices for him. The challenge, as somebody had noted with the living sacrifices that we we frequently climb off the altar. Sculptors have said the same about God being our, a potter and molding us into his image. But as clay, we climb off the potter's wheel. Or we dismount from the easel 
where he is doing his artistic work? Are we, like we saw in the depiction with Tommy and Eddie, uh, we're, we're always, not always real willing for the sculptor to do his sculpting work on us, to turn us into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. And communion reminds us why we do and why we should and that we can. And so for those of us that know the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, communion is given to us as a reminder. And the Apostle Paul said to the church in Corinth, that which I received I pass on to you, that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he, and he broke it and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. And, and, and so let's thank the Lord for the gift of his life for us. Father, we, we come overwhelmed with gratitude. On this Memorial Day weekend, when we think with gratitude about those that have given their life for our nation, how much more appropriate that we once again remember the death of your son, our Lord Jesus, in our place that we might live, that we might be spared death, that we might experience freedom, freedom from sin that would separate us from you for all of eternity. And so we thank you for the gift that is ours in Christ Jesus. For both the symbol of the bread and the symbol of the cup, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. And so as the Lord Jesus invited his disciples to do that Passover night, all of you eat of it. Jesus took a glass of wine and he referred to it symbolically as his blood because without the shedding of blood there's no forgiveness of sins and Jesus was for the Jewish nation and for us down through the centuries the final sacrifice no more blood sacrifices needed to be offered because he gave his life for us and his invitation to his disciples and to us down through the centuries. From me to you this morning is all of you drink of it. Father, we're grateful for the gift of your son, for the life that is ours in Christ Jesus. For those that may be watching this morning that don't yet know you as their personal savior, might this be a day of decision for them, that they would come to understand that apart from you, there's, there's no salvation. Apart from you, there's no changing of life direction, that you're our only hope. And Father, might they find that in you, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. If indeed that might apply to you, if you don't yet know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you've not opened up the door of your life as symbolically talked about in Scripture, then we'd love to help you with that process, to help you understand why it is you need to because of your sin, what it is that Jesus did for you to take the penalty of that sin and die in your place, for you to place your confidence in that, your faith in that, so that you would become a child of God and change your destiny from hell to heaven, to be transitioned from darkness to light, as it said, to experience that transition from death to life. It's a free gift. It's yours for the asking. It's yours for the believing. Yours for the trusting. And we'd be honored to help you. You can reach out to us at hobartnewlifechicago.org and we'll be thrilled to help you both understand or to make that decision to answer questions that you might have. Please don't delay. 
in making that decision if you've not yet already. We love you, we care for you. Our worship team sings another song for us as we come to a close. Well, New Life family, we come to the end of another service this morning. And I hope that you've been encouraged as we've spent time worshiping the Lord in song and, and hearing uh, the profound truths from His Word. I hope that the message today resonated with you and that um, it just encourages you to, to uh, live out your life as the masterpiece that God has called you to be. Um, not just throughout this week we're about to embark on, but... Uh, throughout the months and years ahead. Today, immediately following our service, we are going to have our usual virtual cafe. Uh, the links to that are going to be in the comments. Uh, so I just want to encourage you to um, join in on that is through the Zoom format. Uh, and this is just an opportunity to, to see each other, to touch base, and to, to give us an update on how you're doing, and uh, to maybe even share prayer requests or or just talk amongst uh, the New Life Hobart family. So if you have yet to join us on a virtual cafe, um, just want to encourage you that maybe make today the first day that you do that. It's truly an amazing time. Also want to remind you that uh, we do, on Saturdays, send out our weekly newsletter. It's called New Life News, which is kind of our way of just um, keeping you updated on what is going on uh, at New Life Community Church Hobart. And it's just a, a it's a, we, we call it a bulletin on steroids. And that's truly what it is. We have articles in there, activities for the kids, as well as updates that you should be aware of. So if you are not getting those, those newsletters that come out on Saturdays, um, it is quite simply because we don't have your email. 
So if you would, uh, if you would like to receive those, um, just go ahead and email hobert at newlifechicago.org and give us your contact info, and we'll be glad to add you to the email list on Saturdays for our New Life newsletter. So we thank you um, uh, for joining us today, and just want to remind you once again that we do depend on your offerings and your gifts uh, to keep this ministry going. Um, so we just uh, want to remind you that that is important to us. You know, your, your gifts not just fund the ministry here, but they truly are making a difference for the kingdom of Jesus Christ. So let's pray. Let's close our service today in prayer. And then I hope to see you in the virtual cafe. So let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for allowing us to worship you this morning. We thank you for the songs that we've sung. We thank you for the words from Pastor Dan that we've heard today. We thank you for the truth of your word and the, the, the power that is in it. And we just, quite simply, Lord, just want to ask that you help us to walk in this truth uh, in the week ahead. We want to commit it to you. We want to pray, Lord, that you are glorified among all things. And Lord, that you take center stage in our lives. Father, that we, that we would each and every day uh, put you first and put you on the throne because God that is rightly where you belong so we thank you in advance for what you're going to do this week we thank you for the work that we've seen you do already even in the weeks past so God we give you all the glory and the praise that you were due we pray these things in the mighty matchless name of Jesus Christ and all God's people said amen God bless and we'll see you next week hope to see you in the virtual cafe